So Mordecai hears the news. He rents his clothes and puts on sackcloth with ashes and is mourning a bitter cry. And he came before the king's gate. And so news gets out. There is mourning among the Jews, fasting and weeping and wailing, and many in sackcloth and ashes. So in verse 4, Esther's maids and her chamberlains come and they tell her what's happening. So she finds out about Mordecai and she sends raiment to clothe Mordecai and to take away his sackcloth from him, but he received it not. And then in verse 5, then called Esther for one of the king's chamberlains, whom he had appointed to attend upon her and gave him a commandment to Mordecai to know what it was. Why, why is this? What's happening? And so Mordecai tells him of everything that's happening, this sum of money that Haman has promised to pay to the king's treasuries for the Jews if, if the Jews are destroyed. And also he gave him a copy of the writing of the decree. Um, Esther sees it. She's, and, and then is charged to, um, that she should go in unto the king to make supplication unto him and to make a request before him for her people. Now, this is where it gets pretty interesting. This is really, honestly, this is the part of the story where if you have if you only know a few details about Esther and her story, it's probably from this these last five, six, seven verses of chapter four. Mm -hmm. This is really kind of the, the crux of the whole story where, um, where Esther has some pretty major, uh, quite frankly, life-threatening decisions to make. Yes. It was. It, it could have been death. Yeah, and, and keep in mind, it hasn't been that long since she knows that she replaced Vashti. <laughs> yes, <laughs> she it could be very present on her mind, yes. And, and this king doesn't seem to be really uh, steady and, and very methodical in his thinking. He seems to maybe be a little more uh, sporadic and and a bit unpredictable at times, and so it's going to add to the complexity here of what's going to now happen. Okay, so here we are. Esther then is, she knows, and let's go to verse 11, all the king's servants and the people of the king's provinces do know that whosoever, whether man or woman, shall come unto the king into the inner court, who is not called, there is one law of his to put him to death except such to whom the king should hold out the golden scepter, that he may live. But I have not been called to come in with the king these 30 days." So she was probably feeling a little bit overlooked, maybe questioning a little bit what the king's feelings were about her, but she knew the law. And that was a frightening thing to think, I'm being asked to go before the king without being called and without seeing him for 30 days. But then what's so stirring is Mordecai's words. In verse 13, Mordecai commanded to answer uh, Esther, Think not with thyself that thou shalt escape in the king's house more than all the Jews. For if thou altogether holdest thy peace at this time, then shall their enlargement and deliverance arise to the Jews from another place. But thou and thy father's house shall be destroyed. And who knoweth? whether thou art come to the kingdom for such a time as this. I have heard that question since I was a little girl and loved Esther for that very question. So, so this is fascinating to me, Joy, because as, as you have uh, studied this book of this incredible woman from, you know, 3,000 years ago, the fact is she came, she was sent from heaven to the earth for such a time as this. But the amazing thing is, is you were sent to the earth for such a time as this, and you've been able to do some pretty remarkable things. And I'm curious if there's, if there's any sense of Esther, the spirit of Esther that you could share with us, where you've gone into situations, whether it be go to a foreign country or go speak in a general conference or go into a meeting with prophets, seers, and revelators or meet with little children in a, in a little branch of some obscure corner of the world where you felt like, I, I can't do this, but then the sense of you're not going in alone. You have God on your side. That's right. That's right. I have seen it in many places in the world, and I have had so many sisters come to me and say, 
I have been feeling impressed to do something, something that's a little bit outside their comfort zone or something outside their normal routine. I could give you a list of all of the things that have been shared with me, but the remarkable thing is it's in service to our God. They're trying to find ways to build the kingdom, to gather Israel, to follow the Savior, and to bring about this wonderful Zion that we look forward to and prepare for the second coming of our Savior. And it's so exciting when every woman can put herself in Esther's place and say, there is no question. I am here now for a reason. I have a work to do and to trust that God will guide me in that work. Esther that. is just our sister. She's just, I just can't wait to meet her and hug her and thank her for that vivid reminder that we all have a purpose here and there are no accidents as to when we came or what, you know, I think of her, she was probably very submissive initially, very um, quiet, um, you know, propi propriety and, and maybe even a little bit shy. I don't know. She, she was very obedient to Mordecai. She lived a quiet life. And then suddenly this occasion arises and leadership came out of her this power, and it was there, but I don't know if she knew it yet. And through this experience, look at what was accomplished, and, and there's so much more. We're just beginning this another row of dominoes, because this was, this was the beginning. If you, in your mind's eye, could picture whatever you think Esther looked like, if you could picture her joining us today, what do you think she might say? Do you, do you think she would say, oh, let me tell you how terrible and, and anxious and fearful this experience was? For, do you think she would mention any of that? Or do you think she would say, this was hard, but, oh, I wish I had 10,000 lives to give the Lord over and over and over again in situations like this where I had to get out of my comfort zone and go and do something that was very, very difficult for me and put my trust in the Lord, even though once again, God's name isn't being mentioned in this story anywhere, but you feel it. It's there. There's this quiet uh, faith in God, this, this confidence in the Lord, this hope for deliverance that, that undergirds this entire story that I think if she were standing here, I think she would say, you know what? I could have stayed silent. I could have kept my my heritage a secret, and I could have sat back and enjoyed a life of ease in, in a king's palace for, what, 20, 30 years most, maybe 40 if she's lucky, and then what? If you take all the very finest that this world had to offer back then, she could have just quietly enjoyed that and watched the rest of her people be destroyed and say, well, it stinks to be them. I, I'm not going to put my life on the line, but I love the fact that she's she's listening to Mordecai's uh, reasoning here. Did you like that line when he said, "Perhaps their deliverance, the deliverance to the Jews, will arise from another place"? Yes. In other words, Mordecai's saying the Jews are going to be delivered, but who knows, Esther? It might be you as a domino in all of their lives. So see, here we've been talking about the Lord placing dominoes incognito into our life. What if we took the perspective when we go to church, or when we go on a ministering visit, or when we fulfill our calling, or when we go to work? It doesn't have to be religious, re religiously related. It could be any interaction. What if we took the perspective of, Lord, help me to be a domino in a positive direction for people that I interact with today. What a difference that would make in our wards, in our stakes, in our homes, in our, in our neighborhoods, in our workplaces, at school, wherever we may find ourselves, if we're, if we're keeping this perspective of who knoweth but what I was sent and you were sent and we were all sent to the kingdom for such a time as this. May I just add that in some of our most difficult decisions, at least I have found this in my life, that is where the greatest growth comes, and that's where we discover God. We discover our eternal Father in heaven in ways that are not possible otherwise. It's, it's a remarkable thing to look back at hard things. 
Um, I remember the first time I was preparing to, to speak in general conference and I just thought, I will die. I will stand <laughs> at the pulpit and I will die. But that was not the Lord's will. He was there to hold me up. He was there to help me do something I couldn't do. That was not something that I was gifted at, but he allowed me to have that experience. And that's what he does for all of us. But sometimes we have to step out of our comfort zone just a little bit. Maybe it's not risking our life, but maybe it's speaking up. Maybe it's, if I perish, I perish. Well, maybe it's, if I say this, I'll lose friends. If I speak up for the truth, maybe people won't like me. It's, it's different for all of us, but His love and His power is the same with all of us. He's there to bless us and enable us to do things that we don't think we can do. I love that. Now, <clears throat> these next few verses, they teach another principle that's, that's kind of vital, I think, for all of us if we're really striving to see the hand of the Lord in our life and to be the hand of the Lord in the lives of other people. Um, you'll notice Esther doesn't, doesn't get this uh, a, a prideful or a cocky stance of, give me this mountain, I'll, I'll take care of it, I got this, I got this everybody, I'm going to be the heroine of the story, I'm, I want my name to be the, the one that's blasted out there. You'll notice there's none of that going on with Esther. She, this experience doesn't increase her pride, the increase of faith actually decreases her pride and increases her humility and her meekness and her recognition, I can't do this alone. I can't. I need help. Isn't it beautiful? I love verse 16 so much because she says, Go, gather together all the Jews that are present in Shushan, and fast ye for me, and neither eat ye nor drink three days, nor night or day. Also, and my maiden, or I and my maidens will fast likewise. Now see, to me, I thought immediately, there's, there's my tribe, they're my group, my, my group of friends, they're right there to support, strengthen, to fast with me, to pray with me. That is so real. That is so real to me. Um, and so will I go in unto the king, which is not according to the law, again, recognizing how dangerous this is. And she says, and if I perish, I perish. She was literally saying, I may not live through this but I am going to be submissive to my, to my Father in heaven. She had to be led by the Spirit. She immediately, well, and it tells, it tells me so much about her character anyway, that she went straight to fasting and prayer. And we all need to combine our faith before we do this. So it was a, yes, very humble. Which, by the way, when you're, when you're struggling with anything in life, it could be health-related, it could be spiritual, physical, mental, emotional, relational, any financial, any of these struggles, when you when you invoke the faith of loved ones, yes. or those in, as you, I love it in your tribe, that 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 circle of people who are with you, they're they're in this struggle with you. There's something powerful about an individual fasting and praying. Ooh, but there's something just powerful about a whole group of people uniting their faith, turning heavenward, saying, "Please help." We can't do this alone. We are not our own savior. It, it was never intended that we that we fix everything ourselves, independent of heaven. And so this is a this is this beautiful moment where they all band together, and then that concluding statement that she makes: "And if I perish, I perish." Great faith. Great faith. So chapter five. Here's the here's the moment we've waited for. So. After the third day of fasting, Esther puts on all of her royal apparel, and she went and stood in the inner court of the king's house, over against the king's house, and he was sitting on his royal throne, over against the gate of the house. Because keep in mind, in, in Old Testament times, the king or the ruler or the, the, the person who's in authority always sits at the gate. That's just the place. And so she's standing there, and verse 2 says, And it was so when the king saw Esther the queen standing in the court that she obtained favor in his sight. Now you'll notice how quickly we went from verse 1 to 2. She's coming in and she's standing there a little bit nervous. And he sees her and he's pleased and he's not going to have her killed. And we're like, oh, 
okay, well, we're, we're good. We, we kind of knew the end of the story, so we weren't really nervous. But I can tell you that Mordecai and Esther and all of the, the inner circle of her closest associates and those who had been fasting for her, they were nervous. They didn't know what the outcome was going to be. And I love that, that as we go through our life, when you find yourself in a trough of life, in a trial, in a tribulation, and you don't know the end of the story, and it can be nerve-wracking and frustrating, if instead of focusing on the fear and the anxiety, if we can just keep our focus on the Lord and move forward best we can, trusting that God knows the end of the story, and he's probably not up in heaven wringing his hands saying, oh no, that, that's just not the God we worship. The God we worship knows the end from the beginning, and as we give him our life and our heart, then the best case scenario works out, even if it may not physically work out the way we had intended. In this case, it is going to work out the way we wanted. So, as you notice, as she comes in to the king and, and as that scepter is extended, she, she doesn't reveal the whole problem. She doesn't try to solve everything at once. She takes it very slowly, line upon line. She's gonna, going to allow the natural events to take place. And in our own life today, I think that's, a, that's an important thing to keep in mind because sometimes we can feel completely overwhelmed. I, I would imagine that when you got called to be the general primary president, yes. That you probably looked at the to-do list of the job description and probably thought, I was overwhelmed. How in the world can anybody do that? Mm -hmm. But what did you do? Well, as you were talking, I was just thinking, isn't that how revelation works, though? Sometimes we get just enough revelation to take a step forward. We don't have to see to the end of the road, but we keep trusting. It comes back to, are we trusting? Are we listening? Are we letting him guide all of these wonderful occurrences in our lives? Love it. And and so in, in your particular instance, you surrounded yourself with some incredible counselors who, by the way, both got taken away from <laughs> you fairly soon. So was that the thereafter? Wrong choice? I'm not sure. Or maybe that was the Lord putting a domino in place for each of those incredible women to prepare them for assignments oh. that they didn't maybe know were coming at that time. Absolutely. I know that with all my heart. Yes. It's a beautiful example. So, in this case, you'll notice there's something powerful about just doing what you can do today, and let that be enough, and, and leave the rest at the feet of the Savior and say, I'm going to keep chipping away at this, and that's what Esther is doing. So, she just comes in and she simply says, hey, um, verse 4, if it seem good unto the king, let the king and Haman come this day unto the banquet that I have prepared for him. So, it's this, it's this, service opportunity. Hey, I've prepared a banquet for you and Haman. Would, would you come That's and… That's what we sisters do. We cook. <laughs> <laughs> the, way to, to, the way to a man's heart through his, through his stomach, right? Yes. That's, and yes. she knows this king very well and is feasting. Yes. <laughs> so, notice when we get to that banquet of wine in verse 6, it says, what is thy petition? And it shall be granted thee. And what is thy request? Even to the half of the kingdom, it shall be performed. He just opened the door for her to say, I'll give you anything you want, even to the half of the kingdom. What do you want? And even then, she didn't reveal everything yet, which is an interesting, raises an interesting question of timing. Mm -hmm. Oh, it certainly does. Because if we continue, uh, let's see, let's go ahead and just go over to, it talks, well, yes, Haman goes and talks to his wife, but let's go over to the beginning of chapter six, because this is when. Okay, so it's that night, the king has gone to bed, and he's having trouble sleeping. Now, think of this as another domino, okay? This is not an accident that he commanded to bring the book of records of the Chronicles, and they were read before the king. And guess what he was reminded of in verse 2? And it was found written that Mordecai had told of Bigthana and Teresh, the two of the king's chamberlains, the keepers of the door who sought to lay hand on the king, Ahasuerus. And the king said, What honor and dignity hath been done to Mordecai for this? It was as if he was reminded, We didn't do anything great to celebrate that Mordecai saved my life. We've got to do something. And what is the most ironic experience here in scriptures? We read, 
in verse 4, And the king said, Who is in the court? And Haman was come into the outward court of the king's house to speak unto the king to hang Mordecai. Okay, so he's coming with that intention. But then Haman, excuse me, Haman came in and the king said unto him in verse 6, What shall be done unto the man whom the king delighteth to honor? The king doesn't say Mordecai's name. He says the man that we want to honor. Now Haman thought in his heart, to whom would the king delight to do honor? More than to myself. So they're in agreement. Haman answered the king, for the man whom the king delighteth to honor. And then verse 8, let the royal apparel be brought, which the king uh, useth to wear, and the horse that the king rideth upon, and the crown royal, which is set upon his head. And bring him on horseback through the street of the city, and proclaim before him, thou shall it be excuse me, thus shall it be done to the man whom the king delighteth to honor. And then the king said to Haman, Make haste and take the apparel and the horse as thou hast said, and do even so to Mordecai the Jew that sitteth at the king's gate. <laughs> what do you think Haman thought of that? You can picture his jaw just dislocating. <laughs> it didn't drop. It just like falls. <laughs> Wait, what? 